I can tell you that uh, when I was an intern, uh, that we had a, a guru that had uh, kind of this little hippie community in uh, New York, and uh, he believed that the, the most important thing in life was to eat brown rice, but nothing but brown rice. And, uh, uh, and, and then we brought in a very, very sick person from this commune with severe vitamin A deficiency. I'll never forget as an intern, corneas were gone. And uh, the lens had popped out, and, and uh, the fact that they would just continue to let this person with this obvious seer affliction, with just more brown rice, more brown rice, really brought to me how bad vitamin A deficiency can be. All right, so we set. This is ready to go. Uh, <coughs> this is a, a series of uh, projects that have been done. A lot of medical students and residents were involved in this. And he kind of a little bit of an interesting story, how sometimes very small things in cataract surgery can result in some pretty substantial, and you know, I think positive benefits. So we're so used to those of us who are involved in cataract surgery, a lot of talking heads out there, and they'll sit there and they'll say, well, I think product A is better than B. No, I think B is better than C. And, you, and I happen to know them well, and I know they're getting paid by A, B, or C to say, and I, and I hear them in the same, in a different venue because now it's a venue they're getting paid by B and all of a sudden B is better than A. And there's almost no objective information of, of what's better than another. And it's, it's uh, certainly something that in my career that's always bothered me about, you know, we, we, we've got to get some objective information so that we can really start saying what's better and what it means. Well, Steve Dewey's a good friend of mine. Uh, Steve has uh, been a very straight shooter. And uh, Steve came up with an interesting concept. And uh, what he said is, is that when you take a phaco tip, and obviously we know the risk for capsular breakage is when we engage the tip with their phaco, uh, with, the, with the phaco tip, when, we, when the capsule is touched, he said, we've always felt that that tip should be sharp. And by sharp, if you look at it, what we mean is, is that it's, it's very tightly machined so that this little edge right here internally and externally is crisp, and that that's going to be important in regards to the overall cutting effect of the tip. But his thesis is that also means when you have motion, if you contact the tip, you are more likely when you engage it to break it. And uh, the little modification that he did, uh, working with Larry Lax at MST, is he said, Let's take that same tip, only we're going to radius and we're going to round both the internal and external edge of that particular tip. Everything else is the same. So it's really a relatively minor change and that that makes it much more capsule friendly and much less likely to break the capsule. That's the thesis. And he's talked about this. He's even did a little work here where he did some video, but really nothing objectively that showed that that made any difference. Now, I'm a big believer in the law of unintended consequence, and that is, is that whatever you gain on one side, what are you losing on the other side? Uh, if we think indeed that the tip edge is critical for its ability to cut and shave, okay, maybe we're being a little more capsular friendly, but also we're losing a lot of efficiency. We're losing a lot of the important effect that that tip needs to provide. So uh, we'll start out with the, any validity of the claim. Can such a small difference really protect the capsule? What's the price? So uh, I'm going to take you through a series of experiments we've done to answer all of this, and I think we've got a pretty good idea in regards to just what that minor change of that tip and what it really provides. So uh, this is kind of fun, and this presentation I gave there was how clinical studies can be fun and how you can think about these things and how it doesn't necessarily need to be horribly complicated to come up with answers. Uh, we know capsular breakage, obviously, this is, this is a, a, a significant problem. Um, lots of things that can occur in association with it. A and so we started out with, uh, you know, trying to do a clinical study. There's just so many uncontrolled variables that go on. How could you uh, say it's just the tip that's associated with these changes? And it would be a very large study to do. So. We said, can we take some fresh human lenses just uh, right out of the eye bank and, and just try touching them uh, because it's that initial contact that's the biggest risk and see if there is indeed a difference between a regular tip and a dewy tip. So we started with fresh human lenses. Uh, want a pretty good vacuum. Uh, figure that vacuum, the higher the vacuum, the more likely you're going to have a greater force. 
uh, good bottle height, uh, good flow, all the kinds of things that we know are more likely to cause capsular breakage. And then the idea is you just tap this intact lens, uh, human lens, and tap it until you break the capsule. Okay? Sounds pretty simple and straightforward. Biggest problem we had in as we ran it, we ran out of uh, fresh human lenses pretty fast. Didn't take long. But we've got some interesting results here. Uh, ran out before we could test that box and that box. But uh, ellipse, an ellipse is a, a motion of the tip, which is very interesting. Um, there is some vertical and horizontal, uh, and, and actually the tip, if you were to measure it over time, will, will subtend an ellipsoid. So uh, kind of think of it a football, but it's a full ellipse, so you don't have those pointed ends, uh, that that's where the tip's going to be. We know that uh, um, ozel will actually subtend an arc going back and forth, an edge of an arc that's moving its shape is very much uh, just wags from side to side. So we found out that when we did the dewy tip, we had to tap on average 47 times. When it was sharp, four, tenfold difference in regards to its likelihood to break the capsule. And that was highly statistically significant. Uh, we did uh, uh, longitudinal, 6 millisecond on, 12 millisecond on, fairly common micropulse type. And that also took 47 taps. We didn't have enough to do the sharp. Ozel uh, at 100% power, these both 100% power, it was 22. Uh, not enough to be statistically significant because the number we had was not large, but suggested maybe there is a difference in regards to power modulation, our likelihood to break the capsule. So uh, we, we couldn't do all we wanted to do and get lenses. It was going to take us 30 years of uh, how many lenses we get through to try to finish all that off. So we needed a substitute. Uh, we wanted to know a little bit more about this transversal and torsional, which are uh, just the ozel and ellipse. We wanted to know what, what tip bore size. I always felt that most likely uh, the, the, the larger the bore size, if you contact it, you're going to have a greater overall suction area holding it, more likely you're going to break it. And uh, uh, can you break it without ultrasound? That's always been a question that people had. If you just engage it, you also need ultrasound at the same time to break the capsule. So this is a result that happened from a very low-tech solution. It's stretched saran wrap on a coffee can. And uh, uh, it correlated fairly well with what we already had done with those human lenses. And uh, even though it may not be exactly the same, at least the likelihood of breaking should be relatively similar. So not perfect, but the best that I think's ever been done. And, and for some reason, nobody's repeated and looked at this. This is probably the only study, it's in the American Journal of Ophthalmology, uh, that looked at this specifically. It came out in about, I think, 2010. So here's the different sharp, think uh, the regular tip, a dull, think of a dewy tip where it's radius along the edge. And the first conclusion we could find is every time we did this, the difference between a rounded edge tip and a regular tip was very substantial, at least not twice as good. It was usually 10 times better or more. So indeed, Steve Dewey's concept of not having a sharp edge tip seemed to make a big difference every time we tested it. And so we did prove that element of his hypothesis, and that is it is protective of the capsule. Some other interesting things we found is that, uh, yes, in general, you're more likely to break it with a 19 gauge than a 20 gauge, as you can see, 92% to 58. That was highly statistically significant. Um, and that you could see that uh, uh, as we move down, uh, and so uh, what we've got here on the dull tip, it, we're so small you can't get statistically significant differences. That those are very, very unusual that you're going to be breaking it. And this is for 200 taps. So we did 200 taps on each one of these to get a lot of numbers. Uh, we also found that uh, when we did a signature, uh, so this would be with a signature, 6 milliseconds on, 12 off, micropulse, uh, that we found out that uh, at 10 percent power, it was uh, uh, not nearly as likely to break uh, as your 100 percent power. You were about the same ellipse. And Ozel, you can see uh, at Sharp, we're about 60, 65, 60 percent. Uh, and then again, it dropped off. But something happened with Ozel. It got more common with 20 gauge. What's that all about? So it actually answered some questions but left a mystery for us. 
to explain why theoretically 19 gauge should be uh, more likely to break, which we were able to indeed prove. But that somehow with Ozil, it's flipping in both instances. It was worth with it. It's worse with the 20 gauge. So um, all of these things were conclusions we'd had and come up. But what, what's this going on here with torsional? that for some reason that a 20 gauge was more severe. Um, and uh, uh, this is a long story and uh, this is actually a relatively long talk and I'm going to jump right to the chase on this. What we found is, is that the newer cartridges in order to try and minimize post occlusion surge, which was a positive, have a negative side effect and that is that the active vacuum at the tip, unoccluded, I mean, I was taught a long time ago that with a peristaltic, you essentially had no vacuum at the tip until you occluded it. But inherent in these systems to control post-occlusion surge is enough friction that the measured vacuum unoccluded at the tip can indeed be as high as 245 millimeters of mercury. Now, that's getting up the same as Venturi. So that uh, our thought that there's a, I think part of the reason why these machines are acting more Venturi-like is they actually are more Venturi-like. They, they are more vacuum-based than peristaltic. Once you're getting that kind of vacuum, in particular as you uh, move from a 19 to a 20 gauge and you do the math, all of a sudden the overall net result on the capsule flips and you're getting greater overall force on the capsule with a 20 gauge. I think that explains the, that particular difference. Uh, notice also that uh, when we get more restricted in the system, we're also going to get less flow. So we're not getting quite what we need. I think these are just examples of how you need to understand that everything that you do that may have a positive, you got to look and see what the negative, what the, the other uh, side of this may be. And uh, uh, that's what we found with that. Now, in both the human lenses, as well as the uh, capsular substitute, even with these aggressive parameters, we never could break either without ultrasound. So I do, I'm not saying it's impossible, um, um, you know, in looking at videos though, it appears as though it's contact plus ultrasound is what breaks that capsule. If you just, if you just touch it, I'm sure, I'm, you know, if, you, if one of you residents is gonna poke hard enough, you can break it, but if you recognize you've just touched it and you pull away, it, it takes ultrasound. But with ultrasound, there's no question that it can just be contact and it's gonna break. Um, I do think a wagging with a sharp tip back and forth uh, and how we use it, we tend to use it at higher energy, is more likely to break the capsule. And I've seen a couple of clinical studies, uh, I haven't seen any published, but I've seen some presented suggest the same thing, that the risk with contact may be two to three times higher with that wagging horizontal motion. I don't know we have enough to differentiate both uh, whether Ozil and Ellipse are different from each other, but I do think in comparison to longitudinal, there, there is an increased risk with contact. And that's worth doing some additional studies, which is frankly something I'm in the planning stage of right now. So, capsular contact with active ultrasound is risky business, radius tip, very protective. We're able to confirm that in that late, latest peristaltic systems can have Venturi-like active vacuum, actually use uh, torsional, and I don't know if we can say transversal or ozil is different, may increase capsular breakage risk. But what are the downsides? Remember, and this is the paper, it came out AGO 2010, and uh, uh, now we need to understand, but, but what mechanically are we losing, okay? I mean, we, we've lost the sharpness, and is that sharpness important for our ability to cut? So this is a more recent study. I got s uh, some of the residents here in the room involved in this. Uh, and uh, uh, a nice paper. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, what price then is with sharp tip? Uh, does this impact cavitational energy? Uh, what about chatter? We got increased chatter associated with us. That's bouncing away from the tip. When that fragment bounces away from the tip, you got two problems. One, you got to go find that particle again. And I think searching around trying to find things is when you often get near the capsule. So you're putting yourself at risk for contacting the cap capsule. But we also showed in a, in a very nice study that uh, Jeff Petty and, uh, was involved in with some uh, medical students that uh, once you have gross chatter, you dramatically decrease your overall efficiency. 
so that the uh, amount of time it takes in a controlled fashion to remove these particles can take a lot longer. And uh, uh, again, a nightmare study to do clinically. You just got so many variables and the numbers in order to do a power assessment is so huge because of all those variables, it can be very hard to do looking at regular cataract surgery. So the solutions start out with a couple of uh, nice studies done and uh, the first one is that we needed some fresh brunescent human nuclei and uh, uh, Jeff Tabin, we told him we needed it and he brought about 60 back from Africa. So these are gonna be pretty hard. These are gonna be on the much harder side that you normally have. Uh, we need to make sure we've got something relatively controlled. And then what you do for efficiency, it's pretty simple. How long does it take to remove a fixed size particle? You can do that in a repeated fashion. And then is it gonna bounce off the tip? We call that a chatter event. How, how often does that happen? Obviously you want, efficiency means as short a seconds as possible to remove a control size, but you don't wanna do that with chatter where it's uh, bouncing off the tip. Um, it was uh, uh, a couple of students who worked over a period of time, uh, Griffin Jardine, some of you remember him, he's now at University of Oregon as a resident, really did a lot of this work but came up with a pretty slick little system of using razor blades where you can take a lens. You, you've got to have a lens that's relatively hard. Uh, can't just take a lens that's coming out of the, the eye bank and do this, but uh, hardening either pig lenses, which is uh, something we did later. Or these are the human lenses. Uh, you put them in a little area that's kind of lens shaped. You cut them into fragments. So you cut them in one direction, turn them around, cut them in the other direction and you end up getting cubes that are roughly two millimeters on the side. And you can put all of these cubes together when you're gonna do runs, you shake it up so you've randomized, you're gonna have some a little harder, some a little softer, you're randomly pulling them out, and now you've got a controlled experiment that can start getting you some data, really comparing things to see what's better and what's not, and you can do this in a very controlled fashion. Um, pretty simple setup, uh, set it inside of here in that, that normal little container we use, uh, wait till you've aspirated it up to the tip, uh, and then once you've got it aspirated, you hit full pedal down, whatever your settings are. Um, every time it bounces off as a chatter event, don't count the time. You, uh, you only count the time that it's sitting at the tip for your efficiency, but you also count each chatter event. Uh, and uh, 10 to 20 runs for modality. Uh, 10 runs is generally what we did with these human lenses because we had a lot we wanted to study and, and uh, somewhat limited amount of material and uh, it's controlling parameters in a way that's very hard to do in patients. So this is the DeMille study, came out in JCRS 2012. Uh, nobody's ever looked at this in this detail. Uh, you can see we tried to look at a lot of different parameters. I just want you to notice, because this isn't the main, we're mainly talking about the Dewey tip, is the broad range that you see here in regards to efficiencies looking at the same technology. I mean, look at Ozil IP, which is kind of the latest variation. We can go from 38.4 uh, down to uh, 4.9 seconds, just based upon what the parameters are. Parameters are critically important. I could design a study, knowing the information here, which I could make any technology look better than the other just on how I adjust the parameters. So just because somebody shows that one thing is better than the other until you know what parameters and to me, you have to show you've optimized the parameters so you're really comparing apples to apples. And that doesn't happen. And that's part of the reason why you'll get A saying I'm better than B and B better than A, because they purposely, I think, have set it up to where they're gonna win. They're not necessarily looking at what the objective side is. Anybody who says these, these technologies that wag side to side cannot have chatter, you can see there are ways to minimize it, but you could also get a lot of chatter depending upon what your overall event is. Uh, the cool thing though is, is now we started having technology, we could look at it even better. This is a correlation between efficiency and chatter, which was highly statistically significant. Remember, we measured efficiency not counting the time when it had bounced off the tip, and yet whenever you, you're gonna have a chatter event, you're also gonna dramatically decrease your efficiency. And I think, because you've got micro chatter, that's where you watch that tip. Those of you who've done cataract surgery, it's sitting at the tip, but it kind of bounces. You see a little bouncing around there until you feel it kind of suck in and then usually it disappears. Micro chatter is also a major cause of inefficiency in removing these particles. 
So the second phase is, because we can't keep expecting Jeff Tabin to come up with a, you know, 50, 60 lens nuclei every time he wanted to test this, is could we come up with a technique to harden pig lenses to get a similar effect overall that we were getting from these human nuclei? And it's really a very nice piece of work that was put together. It's a variable time soaking in formalin and then in BSS for 24 hours to get a consistent hardness. Then you got to use them acutely after that. You can't wait very long uh, or you can, you, you'll start getting softening and changes in the lens. Again, the same overall idea, cut them two millimeters to the side, mix them all up together, and now you've got a randomized way of doing some very good comparative information. So. Uh, Beautiful piece of work here. You can see that uh, uh, this is the pig lens itself. Uh, they're hard enough. You could cut them up relatively well. Uh, and this is how hard they are. And we just little test by crushing them to half their thickness. And we had our results from the original human lenses with a standard deviation here. And you can see two hours does it. And, uh, and so now we've got a very easy way of actually duplicating with pig lenses, human lenses, in, uh, in order to study these things. And there's lots of cool tests that have gone on and several other papers, as Nick knows about, that have come along. And I think it's, a, I think it's, a, it's great. Objectively, look at some of these things for the first time ever. So um, this is the results looking at ellipse FX that we had before. And you can see that the two hour on that one, and this is the human results, were very, very similar. So a two hour is going to be very close. Same thing with Ozel. You can see there we are, very, very similar. And this time we use exactly the same parameters. We use the optimal parameters that we had discovered from the original test. So we're trying to do what's the best of breed, and then how well can we duplicate that with pig lenses. But more was done here. Also, for the first time, looked at longitudinal. There's been a lot of studies that have been out there that show that say torsional is better than longitudinal. But what do they compare it to? Continuous longitudinal. That's like saying, I want to compare a nifty uh, pistol I have with uh, uh, somebody else's pistol, but instead of using their best pistol, I'm going to use an old flintlock. I mean, longitudinal was shown a long time ago not to be the best way that you can deal with longitudinal. That uh, uh, at least it would appear micro pulse, these very short pulses may have some advantage. Nobody looked at it. This is a very preliminary look. More work has been more comprehensive. But this is comparing 50% power to 25% power. And then we use the same parameters that had been the best for Oslo and Ellipse. Are those the best parameters for micropulse? Don't know. That work is now still ongoing, but at least we're comparing the same thing. And what you can see is on average at 0, 1, and 2 hours, very consistent results moving through here. The harder they got, but you, you certainly saw a, a larger difference between them. And it was fairly, it's not quite, but almost twice as much. So it would appear indeed that in regards to the overall time that 50% was a better way to go. And, uh, and then we used that 50% uh, on and said, well, let's compare it to Ozil IP. And uh, in spite of what people have said that it's dramatically better, it was actually not statistically better, but it was actually shorter. It was not too far off being statistically significant. So this concept that longitudinal is old-fashioned and not nearly as good didn't bear up in this study. Uh, and then compared to ellipse FX, ellipse FX was a little better. But again, these were not statistically different. So uh, at least in the preliminary study, best longitudinal does not appear to be worse than best of the other. They appear to be very similar in their efficiency. And as far as chatter is concerned, they were all very minimal. So the idea that one has a lot more chatter than the other did not pan out looking at these relatively hard. Chatter events were not statistically different and were very close to zero throughout. So uh, things get touted as better, and nobody ever looks at it carefully. I'm not sure if we were able to show that any of them using best scenarios were any different than each other. But the beauty of this is now we have the ab ability to look at the Dewey tip and ask truly, does it, as a result of being protected the capsule, does it result in less efficiency? Because now we can do a head-to-head -head comparison. 
And uh, uh, these are the results as we went looking through this. So um, this is, Al they put Alcon on here. Uh, I, I need to get better slides on this, but essentially this is Ozil IP. And you can see that with the non-radius tip, on average it was a second, and that with the Dewey tip it was 1.8 second, and that was statistically different. So it took about 80% longer to remove a nuclear fragment with the Dewey tip than it did with a regular tip. Um, that's probably clinically important, you know, 80% longer. And this is for each time you're removing, you know, a certain size chunk of material. But it would appear as though, yes, there is a distinct downside uh, in association with use of Ozil. It's probably clinically important. So what about uh, uh, looking at the ellipse FX, this, this uh, ellipsoid area? Uh, looked at that, did the comparison, no difference. I mean, those, you see the P, I mean, those are, those are, I mean, you're talking less than a hundredth of a second. A everybody agrees. They're not only not statistically different, those, they're the same. So interestingly, a Dewey tip in regards to its overall motion for at least with an ellipsoid movement didn't appear to make any difference. It was just as efficient. Now, it's interesting to think about why that might be. It's been surmised for a long period of time that uh, because of the motion of Ozil where it subtends an arc, that most of that overall cutting effect is a shaving effect. And if you think about it, that makes logical sense. Now, if any of you have been involved, who are woodworkers, the rest you're trying to do shaving, sharpness of your shaving tip is really important, right? I mean, you, you, tr you try and use a chisel if you want to do shaving that's rounded and dull all around the edge, and you're going to have a heck of a time doing <laughs> any shaving. So I think it makes logical sense that if shaving is a critical motion and you've rounded that edge, cut off the sharpness, you're going to lose efficiency. So it doesn't surprise me if indeed that is the main part of what the Ozil effect does, that rounding that edge is less efficient. Now this ellipsoid motion, um, there's a little difference in the cavitation that's probably going to be created in association with that. And there's a fair amount of longitudinal motion it appears as though shaving is not nearly as important. And whatever, there definitely, there's the proof of the pudding right there. Those are not different. Those are exactly the same numbers. So a Dewey tip, if you're going to be using ellipsoid type motion, uh, you can get at least a tenfold better protection of capsular breakage with no loss of efficiency. That's clinically important, right? Isn't the worst thing we run into is capsular breakage? Isn't that the biggest risk that we have? If you can cut that tenfold doing nothing else and not lose efficiency, I think that's, that's, uh, that's pretty important. So what about looking at 612 micropults? We do 610 micropults, again, exactly the same, as suggesting that the longitudinal motion does not require a sharp edge. Those numbers, again, those, those are not just not statistically. I mean, meaning they're the same as one. That's about, that's about as close as one as you can get. Those are exactly the same. And therefore, uh, those who are using micropulse or ultrapulse for a variation, again, the Dewey tip does not result in any loss of efficiency whatsoever in the motion in association with that. Again, uh, I think uh, interesting, cool information to have, potentially clinically important. Now. It turns out that as we ran that batch and we looked at our overall times, they were uh, more on the soft side. And we have found, since we've now done a series of these, that uh, the amount of time of hardening very much depends upon the age of the pig lenses you get. Some pig lenses come in a batch are much, much harder than others innately. And therefore, <coughs> you need a little more uh, time. And so uh, a variation we do now is you get a batch you run it, check about how long it's taking in a controlled way, and then you may have to harden them a little more to get a consistent period of time that's more like you're harder. And this first batch we had was relatively short. And I said, you know, people are going to run the question. We just ought to answer already. Let's make them harder, and let's do a four, what's like a four plus to a really brunescent cataract to see if this information holds. Because what I hear some people say with the Dewey tip, well, I don't know if it, and Steve has said this, I don't think it makes a difference until you get to a really hard nucleus. 
and then I think the Dewey tip is less efficient. Well, guys, we can answer this, so let's go on. Let's get another run. Let's put this together. So as you can see that these are harder because the amount of time, remember we're down around a second, now we've increased their hardness to their over two. So these are roughly two times harder than what we'd had in the initial set of experiments. The results in regards to a torsional are exactly the same. That's a almost double, so 80 to 90 percent longer, statistically significant, so indeed, ozzel seems to be very important that it has that sharp edge for the shaving effect and overall your efficiency is going to be about half of what it is. Take about twice as long to remove with ozzel. What happens when you go to Lips FX? Those are again exactly the same. See what your p-value is? So confirmed it now, uh, time to removal here is uh, actually about a little over twice as long and you can see that it does not make any difference. And to complete the story, 6, 12 milliseconds off on. And frankly, it was a bit, the radius was even a little less. Don't know what that's all about. Could just be sampling error. Those are not statistically different. But again, it only appears with ozzel at a dewy tip, results in less efficiency, and it's roughly going to about double your time to removal. For the others, they are exactly the same. Uh, chatter, I can tell you there was no difference in chatter. So you weren't getting an increase in chatter. Dewey tip doesn't seem to make any difference. Those were exactly the same for all of them. Only the efficiency was impacted. Uh, so I think it's the tip action as mentioned. It's a shearing effect. Uh, that longitudinal motion doesn't seem to need it. And uh, uh, no difference in chatter as pointed out. Uh, it is true that uh, transversal and micropulse have been shown by Mark Schaefer an ultrasound engineer to induce more cavitational bubbles at lower energy. So potentially cavitation is a more important factor and obviously the dewy tip doesn't appear to have any impact on that cavitational energy. Conclusions, depending on if you're using Osl or not, I think dewy tip is great. Uh, I, I don't use Osl uh, and I've gone to a dewy tip. I think that uh, if, if it's a, if it's going to decrease my risk of capsid or breakage, should I inadvertently contact the capsule tenfold with no other loss? To me, that's kind of a no-brainer. So personally, I thought Dewey's come up with a, something fairly cool. Um, at least uh, the, the way I'm doing it, I don't see that I've lost any efficiency. And this is what's fun about clinical research. You know, you can pose these questions, you can sit and get some pretty definitive answers. Uh, for the first time, we're answering a whole series of questions. Uh, both Brian's are involved in this uh, uh, work we've done. Uh, Jeff Petty, Bill Barlow, where's Bill? Bill was over here. He's been involved in some of this. And we're finding out what is the most efficient uh, on and off time uh, for longitudinal ultrasound. And it's not exactly what a lot of people thought. And uh, uh, we've got uh, a, a paper that's just getting ready to be submitted. And, uh, you know, what, what, what's the difference in regards to bore size and the overall size as far as efficiency? It turns out it's not a linear relationship. Your, your uh, 20 gauge is far and away more efficient than 19 or 20. And I, th th these are the kinds of questions that I think are going to be a lot of fun here as we move, move on. Uh, that's where clinical research, I think, uh, really is, uh, uh, can be a joy and why I get as much kick out of it and getting these responses now as I did uh, 30 years ago. And so uh, small change in a tip, does it make a difference? I think it does, and I think it was actually clinically pretty important. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Huh? Yes, Nick? Right. Yeah, I think Jeff would have we'll get about 10 different studies lined up, some more we just recently did, and uh, this can be a lot of fun. I'm just giving another example. Uh, when uh, Ozzel first came out, and uh, I heard Dick McCool stand up and he said, 
this modality 100% protects against wound burn. You put it 100% power, pedal to the metal the entire case, you cannot get a wound burn. And a lot of people took that up. Then I, then I was hearing, you know, I've got a wound burn. And I'd never had a wound burn before. And yet you were still hearing at the podium, 100% you can't get a wound burn. So we did a, it's a series of work, but uh, the, the most important is this, this uh, uh, national survey in the United States and Canada and uh, where we could get about a million cases. And uh, uh, yeah, there's a, always a bias in a survey, but most people remember their wound burns pretty well. Net result is it turns out that uh, Ozil was not protected against wound burn at all. In fact, it, it, it was right in the middle of the pack, and uh, it was it was uh, uh, probably better than continuous, but that uh, it was not statistically so. In fact, it turns out that power modulation wasn't important in prevention of wound burn. Uh, far and away, the biggest cause of wound burn was the use of Helon five. And then it was how you, how you use it. If you're a divide and conquer surgeon, you're much, much more likely to get a wound burn than if you were uh, a chop. In that it was your approach that was made important. But the power didn't, no, there was no protection for any of the different power modalities from wound burn. So that's, uh, that's kind of fun stuff. Yes? So I'm going to answer your question really, really fast. What you see here in a few things we put here is the only time this has ever been looked at by anybody. And we're starting out with the very basics. So anything that you talk about that, that is slightly more esoteric or exotic, the, sh the short answer is no. And I'm not aware of anybody who's even trying to do any of this yet. Nick, are you getting anything else other than our group? Mm -hmm. I'm amazed at how many people who were willing to put their name and reputation who are s almost like they're ignoring that this is getting objectively looked at at this particular time. So the short answer is no, but you know, that, that'll be 13, there you go. We'll get Larry Lax to make up some interesting tips and look at them, but, but we can answer those questions now. So that, that's, uh, that's gonna be kinda cool. All right, thank you.